Welcome to another episode of Relentlessly Resilient, where real people share real life experiences and the tools they've developed to move forward and live their best life. I'm Michelle Scharf. And I'm Jenny Taylor. And today we are back with part two with Beth McDonald. Beth, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, good. So Beth, remember everyone, is one of the wonderful guests that we met through the organization called The Unquiet Professional. It's a great group back east that each year around Memorial Day honors different military surviving families. They have a virtual mile. They do some fundraising. They just do a lot of good. And that's how we first met Beth. And we interviewed her last week. You might have remembered listening to her episode And then we realized, oh my goodness, she's got so much more. It's hard to tie it all into 45 minutes. And so we're so glad that you agreed to come back, Beth. And we wanted to know if you would first kind of give us a recap of our first visit with you. Remind us all who you were and what you shared. Then we're going to jump into the next chapter. We joked off air. I don't dare call it chapter two because it's assuming you've only ever had two chapters in your life. But we, we learned about you and, and your first husband and his military death and, and that journey. Give us a little recap and then I'm really excited for what you have to offer us today in terms of living resiliently. Last week we talked about who am I and who Trent was. And he was such an incredible person and an incredible soldier and leader. And we hit the wave tops of our life together. And really, it was a great life. He was such a great person. He's very much missed. We talked about his death and what happened during the events surrounding his death and our daughter, Gwen. And then what resilience means to me, which I think is acceptance and accepting the reality of what you're facing and your feelings, accepting all of the feelings because there's just so many of them. You're on a roller coaster ride, really. I think that's a quick summary. Yeah, no, that is great. And Gwen, it was great to learn about her. Now remind us how old she was and how old she is. How old was she when her father died? How old is she now? She was eight when he died and she is 18 today. Oh, today. Oh my goodness. Okay, so here we are. It's been 10 years we yep. know that um, we could easily spend hours and hours just talking about the the days right after he died, the weeks right after he died, the months right after he died. But what we want to do today is take that decade from you as a, a young widow, you've got a young daughter, your husband's not coming home. How do you pick up those pieces? And then walk us through what happens next. You have a beautiful life now, very meaningful, very full full of giving, full of helping. Can you just give us a background of how that transition came about from the days of that early grief to walking in toward this next chapter as you and your daughter have moved forward? It was a really interesting transition because when your husband dies and it's a military death, everyone is extremely supportive. But you're in this bubble and everyone is so focused on, you know, your, your husband was a hero and he died and it's a lot. There's a huge impact on your life and you have all of this grief and you're grieving publicly. And there's a lot of, there's so much involved with this grief because it's, it's not personal. It's, it involves so many people. So it's not really your grief and you lose a lot of yourself, I think or there's potential to lose a lot of yourself. So in the weeks immediately following my husband's death, I honestly don't remember what happened when it happened because it's all a blur. I do remember we tried to set a timeline for things like the memorial, the funeral, and how we were going to keep things in order. And at what point I would go back to work. And I went back to work several weeks later and my bosses were phenomenal with, you know, taking as much time as I needed. But Gwen was in school. And I remember Gwen had kept getting these letters saying she has all of these unauthorized absences. (laughs) And I was so angry with those. I was like, can you just send those to, you know, somebody down in Afghanistan, please? Yeah, right. Send those to the cemetery and see if you understand why my daughter's not in class today. Yeah. And I had spoken to the principal at the school and I asked if they could just please maybe think about not sending these right away. And she was like, oh, yeah, no, we're monitoring all the mail. And they hadn't. 
And then, you know, of course, I get the letter saying I have to go in front of the school board to talk about why she's had so many absences. And I was like, oh, I refuse. (laughs) No, I'm not doing that. And so there's like all of, you know, life goes on. And one of the hardest, harshest realizations after the dust starts to settle and after the funeral, after the memorials is life is going on. Life has been going on this whole time. And now you've got to jump back through the revolving door and hope you don't get your leg caught because everything's still happening. School's still happening and you still have to be accountable for all of this stuff. And, you know, as widows, a lot of us are like, don't you know my husband's dead? And a lot of people are like, no, I didn't know. It's like, it is. It's so rude. (laughs) I remember being in the grocery store and it hit me all of a sudden that grief, you know, and mm-hmm. I started crying and I had to walk out and I, I was just so mad at everyone for not knowing my husband was right. dead. How dare the world keep <laughs> yeah. turning. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I don't think you understand it unless it happens to you. Cause I certainly n- never did before. And I, right. I didn't know it until that moment Yeah, that I just yeah. all of a sudden got really emotional, felt all these feelings, start crying. And then I'm embarrassed. So I leave out of this store and then I sat in my car and I'm just so angry and I'm screaming because how dare these people not understand my husband's dead. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. The, the and then, stopped. you know, retail workers mm-hmm. are like, you know, here I am just standing here and you're just like, my husband's dead. And like, yeah. what am I supposed to do? And I'm like, something, do something. Just it's, now your fault. Yeah. it's now in your hands. I've right. now made it your responsibility. I'm giving it to the dead. universe. Yep. Do you have an extra large in the size? <laughs> Something. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this whole thing, I'm like, oh, I've got things to do. And I don't want to do any of them. But yeah. I have to because it's part of my healing process. I recognize that. But, I, you know, I'd still rather kind of just keep going through Lilith's fair, listening to the Sarah McLaughlin music. This is my turn to grieve now. I've done all the things I was supposed to do, did all the things I told my husband I would do, none of which I wanted to do. And I'm mad at him. I'm telling him I'm angry. And I don't have the pleasure of listening to him tell me he doesn't care. He's dead. <laughs> so, like, An empty I'm echo chamber. marital argument. So how do you get back to work? Yeah. So how do you keep going with that then when it does feel kind of that cruel reality that the world kept turning, even though your world stopped? Right. So I go back to work and I open my desk and I've got all kinds of shenanigans going on in my desk. You know, I'm a somewhat not very serious person at all, but I've had this quote in my desk that I had kept for a very long time and it was part of Stephen Pressfield's The Warrior Ethos. And for so long, we had this, we called it a sign garden coming into my building at work. And it was The Warrior Ethos. Never leave a fallen warrior behind or anything like that. And, you know, it's all The Warrior Ethos and you're walking up the sidewalk and blah, blah, blah. But we never spoke about the wives. But this particular part of the story was about the wives and how the wives of Sparta were chosen for their strengths to rebuild if anything happened to the warriors. And when King Leonidas went out to Thermopylae, you know, when he went to war and he brought those 300 with them, he knew they weren't coming back. And so he chose those 300 warriors specifically for the strength of their wives to rebuild Sparta because he knew that he was just stalling the enemy long enough for Roman reinforcements to come in to back up Sparta. So he had a specific job. He knew they were all going to die. He knew the wives were going to rebuild and not fall to their grief. And I kept that in my desk for years. And I remembered that. And I had to regain my own identity through all of this. And remember, I was still someone too. And I still had goals I uh, throw a dart at a board. I didn't know what I was going to do with any of the goals that I had, but I had to get back to that point. And I thought about Alice in Wonderland. I used to be much more muchier. How do I get to that point? So I, I had it. I had the idea. I had to get there. And it was a slow process. You don't just realize that and think, oh, well, I'm going to be happy now because you still have the grief. This is only, only like month one on this journey, there's still a lot more tears to be had. 
but at least when you're spinning around and you don't know what direction you're going to go, you've got an idea like, okay, there was a part of me before all of who I used to be. Then I became us. Now I'm me again, but I'm also a mom. And now I've got to redevelop my identity and I can do that. And that's challenging. I feel the same Mm. way. I, you know, I was maybe 24, 25 when I married my husband, we were married for 15 years of for sure being us. And then Mm -hmm. he's gone. And I know I'm still in there. I love that you said I used to be much more much here. I, I know I'm in there. How do you find that? How do you bring that back out? What did that journey look like for you? And what does it still look like for you? So for me, it was a lot of me is just being ridiculous and, you know, listening to Footloose because that somehow helps because I can't dance, but I absolutely will try. And I absolutely a thousand percent do ridiculous things like Disney World. But everybody has their own (laughs) idea of what what their magical thinking is. And, you know, in, in psychological terms or in, you know, neuroscience, magical thinking always helps heal the brain. And how do we heal? Well, humor heals the brain a lot faster than anything else we have in our the back of our cap. You know, we have serotonin uptake inhibitors. We've got all kinds of other actions, smells. There are so many tools that we can use to try to retrain our brain, but humor is the one thing that works the fastest scientifically. And I was so annoyed to find out that I paid a lot of money to find out that a platitude was all I really needed educationally to get through my grief journey. But <laughs> um, <laughs> it it helps. And a lot of people, depending on your humor, a lot of people have told me that it's always too soon for me to make the jokes that I make. And I'm like, it's never too soon. And I'll, That's uh, my I'll oldest daughter. That- yeah, <laughs> we, we joke about that. We're like, sometimes you have to keep that joke for people who maybe understand the inside piece of it, because otherwise <laughs> yeah. it can feel a little dark my and daughter, a little inappropriate. Yeah. My daughter has told me too before when I've said something that was kind of dark widow humor. And we've gotten in the car and she's been like, Mom, you you can't do that to people. It's not fair. <laughs> and, but, oh, you know, Beth. when you're the widow, you don't yeah. really, it's like, it's yeah, just I'm just reality. trying to cope. Yeah. And it's just my reality. <laughs> and you see the look on their face that they're pained for you. And then yeah. you just want to make some and it's just joke. Awkward. And it's yeah. awkward. And you want to make it lighter. But then... <laughs> Then that also sometimes is disturbing to be <laughs> backed into that corner. All right, Beth, we're gonna Beth, we're gonna take a quick break and come back and have you keep talking to us about humor, about some of this research. We know you've been a part of all kinds of studies and books and and Harvard and different things. But I'll tell you what I'm taking away from today: your journey to healing involved a lot of being ridiculous. I can take that home with you. Yes. We'll be right back. <laughs> Beth, tell us this magical thinking, this being ridiculous, this positive humor. How how have you found that? What have you done with that? How do you use that day to day? I know you write in a column that has humor. I know you work with clients and coaching. I'm sure you use humor. Tell us how this humor has helped you heal and where it fits in with resilience. I don't shy away from a lot of the obvious things. So I try not to be as insensitive as I absolutely could come off as, <laughs> I think is probably the best way to say it. We um, should have a little dark widow humor sideshow <laughs> after yes. this is over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of people, you know, they, they either are like, wow, that was so honest. And I'm like, it's either observational or honest humor. I don't, I don't ever aim to be offensive, <laughs> but you know, it's from my own experience and it's either Mark Twain or Shakespeare said that humor is tragedy plus time. And, you know, in the military, we're early for everything. So, you know, again, never too soon, but it's picking out the honest things that are going on. And then, you know, everything is a little bit ridiculous. If you think about it, life is a comedy for those who think it's a tragedy for those who feel. And life is always going to give you an opportunity to cry. The tears come easily enough. And, and I don't deny the tears when they do come, but I'm absolutely going to take every opportunity to laugh. Because those opportunities don't always present themselves. 
and I've been cursed with laughing in stressful situations, which is a terrible, terrible curse because I'm the guy that laughs at funerals. So you've always got to try to keep that down a little bit. During this whole tragedy, my daughter and I still went to Disney World, and as often as we could, you know, it'd be fiscally responsible at the same time because you can't just be low and run off and, you know, do all the irresponsible things. As right. much you as do I'd have to. to live in reality. Yeah, you still have to exist in this place where you have to pay your bills and feed your dogs and, <laughs> and water do your, your laundry. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, but, you know, you just, you find a place to escape, and that's the beauty of some things is you're just escaping the harsh reality that you have to live in. And we went on this one trip to Disney World, and Trent had planned it. He had died before, you know, he could go. And I was mad because I was like, he ruined our Disney trip. And I said that, and one of my girlfriends looked at me like, well, did you just say that out loud? And I was like, well, yeah, he had planned this. Before he deployed, we were supposed to go, and I thought, here we are. We're going to be so resilient and go on this trip by ourselves, and I brought my sister with me and her family. And then within two days, two of my friends had died oh. while we were at Disney, <laughs> and everybody kept saying, have a magical day. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh. Oh. So <laughs> wow. my sister, who's got the same sense of humor that I have, we were sitting outside the Carousel of Progress, which is our favorite lazy ride. Because we could just sit in there and take a nap and go around in circles for a long time. And they're, they're playing the song, There's a Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow. And it was after my second friend had died. And my sister finally had had enough of it. And she goes, oh, for sake, no. She's like, not for the people that are dead. And she just yeah. stormed off. And I was like, oh, that's true. It's <laughs> true. You're not lying. So. <laughs> At that point, I was like, it's probably time for me to go back to the hotel. I can't, like, I had been trying to just troop it out throughout the day. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to cash it in for the day. And one of my friends who had died through my daughter's baby shower, her husband was my daughter's godfather. And so, you know, I called him to check in on him and see how he was doing. And miserable of course so I was like oh well I'll check in with you after the funeral which was going to be after Christmas it's two weeks before Christmas at this point 2012 four months after my husband died yeah. and so I was just like you know you gotta bleh. some days you just mm, bleh, you can't there's no words so it just went on and flew back home and because the funerals were back to back in different states i didn't go to any funerals i was like i'm just gonna hide under my bed and hope nobody else dies through the end of the year yeah just and hold on tight so yeah exactly hold on tight at this rate you don't know what else is coming and so yeah i called after the funeral the day after the funeral because that's pretty much the worst day and it's settling in pretty hard that day and so mason and i started talking that day and like on a regular basis, I hadn't talked to him in about six years since we had last seen each other when we were stationed together in Italy. And he was Trent's friend. His wife was my friend. We didn't really interact much. But now that our spouses were dead, we were in this unique position together. He had a son, had a daughter. And, you know, and I, I asked him, you know, do you need any help? Because, you know, spouse deaths, dependent deaths are treated differently in the Department of Defense system with insurance and all that stuff. And, you know, I had some resources for that and I asked if he needed any help and we started talking, we started going through our paperwork processes together and we became friends. And you know, when you're in widowhood and your friends start to step away from you because they don't want the, they don't want to get the grief on them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or they don't want to get the death on them. And I, I had had like three deaths in just like a few months and people were like, Oh, like you are contagious and people are saying things to me like, you know, like, Oh, have a good day. I didn't mean that you're never going to have a good day again. And I was thinking like, I want to have a good day. Like that's what I want to get to inherently. I want to have a good day. I wake up. Yeah. And it's have kind a of good day. important to believe that we will get back to that because it doesn't feel like it in the moment, but when no. we're in that moment, we're kind of like, Oh my gosh, I hope I can get back to like when do, yeah. when does like, this get to be some kind of acceptance that I do get to have a good day and I don't have to feel bad yeah. about it because 
that's the one thing that kind of pulls you through it all, right? Yeah. Yeah. I know for me and it did. When you're, yeah, when you're in the middle of all of that crying and, you know, like the constant grief, the constant crying, the constant, you know, you are blowing your nose in your T-shirt, your head hurts, everything is just horrible. And it's painful, like viscerally painful to your core. You get out of bed on those days if you just want to have a day. You don't want to have to tell anybody or think, like, my husband's dead. You don't want to go to the grocery store. Like, you just want to be able to just make it through that day. Not make it worse. Just have a day. And so when people would, would like, backtrack and be like, you're never going to have a good day again. I was like, oh, my God. Could you imagine? No, I do want to have a good day. Yeah. And, yeah. and I would think about Trent. And I feel like Trent would want me to have a good day. Trent would be so mad at me if I were sitting on the couch like a lump and be just, yuck. he'd be like, get up, like make life good for Gwen. Mm. Even, even if he couldn't stand me, he'd be like, do it for Gwen. Yeah. And of course he loved me, but even if he did it, let's take that off the table. Let's say because people have had bad relationships or people had split up, do it for your kids. Right. You know, and it's okay to do it for yourself. It's perfectly okay to do it for yourself. And there's a lot of widows out there who have that guilt because there's so much scrutiny on them. And we have an expectation that we have to honor our husbands and we do, but it's so public and we can do that but what if we fall in love again? And that's okay too. And there are people out there who say, how dare you? You shouldn't be in love with anybody else. You shouldn't marry somebody else. Well, you know what, buddy, this isn't your journey. Yeah. So, you know, so I'm it, curious, it, you s- tell us, tell us about your journey there, because you said you've, you mentioned Mason is a friend yeah. of your husband's. Is this, yep. is this where and you fall in love? Is this where that journey goes? This is where, yeah, this is absolutely where this journey goes. Okay, tell and us, much tell to us my that surprise. journey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was not, I was not ready for Mason McDonald. I was not because I was like, okay, when Gwen is done with school, I'm going to never, I'm never doing this again. Just join a convent. I don't know. Probably wasn't a convent. It was. Probably, I don't know where I was going to go. Move to France and be a writer or something. I don't know. I had plans that did not include Mason McDonald, and. I had never, ever looked at him that way when he was married to my friend. And now I'm looking at him like, hmm, <laughs> and like, so we get to that point in our friendship where I'm like, oh, I've got the feelings for this guy. And I tell him and he's like, yeah, me too. And I'm like, okay. So, you know, now this is going in a different direction and you hope you're not ruining your new best friend in the friendship. Sure. Yeah. Because like we're besties now we're widow buddies now. And you know, widow buddies, widow buddy mafia is strong. Like you got that connection. Yep. Yeah. Like by the time the Arlington cemetery headstone came in, his wife's headstone came in. So we were correcting headstones together, Mm. you know, like we've, you know, inseparable now and I'm like oh what if we don't have any chemistry that's going to be horrible and I was like more for him than for me because I'll just forget about it and I told him that and he was like why do you have to pin this on me and I'm like because I'll never take the responsibility for it so we you know we realized that we've got something and he eventually asks me to marry him and I say no that's a terrible idea when do you want to do that (laughs) and so we we get married And it's like, wow, never, I never saw that coming. So he ruined my life because I didn't want to ever fall in love again. Why would you want to? Why do you want to go through all that heartache again? Yeah. And then I realized it doesn't matter. I'm already there. (laughs) So So in in what year did you guys get married? How long ago has it been now? 2014, we got married. It was a 2015. Oh gosh, I don't know. Mason knows. There's That's so many fine. dates. I don't even seven, know. Seven, eight ish, seven, yeah. eight ish years. Yeah, That's something okay. like that. That's okay. Yeah. All right. And he what, knows I don't know. what does he do professionally? What are you now doing professionally? Bring us a little up to he, speed. He was in the army. Why would, like, how stupid am I? <laughs> do that he again. He was a, yeah, I'm an idiot. And I know, like, I'm, I'm confident in my intelligence. I am confident 
that I am very intelligent in some areas, but I am the guy that gets out of the car with your seatbelt on. So this is that for me. So Mason is, you know, tall, handsome, intelligent. He is a pilot. He's got pilot hair and he's got all this going on for him. And I'm like, all right, well, you know, well, that happened again. Now I'm in love. Darn it. But bonus, you know, I got me some insurance again. So I got me some TRICARE. And he retired in 2017. And now he uses all of his brains to teach people stuff because he's brilliant. And that's also annoying because he doesn't do any, like, he doesn't mess anything up. I don't know that there's anything he can't do either. So... And he, everybody loves him. Everybody loves him. So, you know, I've got to, I've got to contend with that too. And my mother once very wisely said when somebody was hitting on Trent and I was like, why would she do that? My mom said, well, look at him. Of course they're going to hit on him. So I have to apply that. Like, yes, of course (laughs) people just love them. I make good decisions sometimes. And then, you know, I immediately regret them because then I have to deal with the weight of that decision with these handsome, intelligent men. So what I do now, I work for the Green Bray Foundation as a veteran service officer. So I can help other widows and veterans with their VA claims and understanding how to navigate the system and provide more resources for them. And Mason is my lovely sidekick, but he does his own thing. I love that. Tell us a little bit about the Green Beret Foundation. A lot of our listeners aren't really familiar with a lot of military world. They might not even know what it means to be qualified as a Green Beret in the military. So can you kind of walk us through what a Green Beret is and then who and what and where and why this foundation is? Oh, I love this foundation. This is probably all-time favorite job. So the Green Berets are an elite force of soldiers that are specially trained and qualified to do certain jobs in the military. Extremely intelligent, and they speak different languages. They have different abilities to do all kinds of really cool stuff, and they wear a green beret to prove that they've been able to accomplish these things. That's the, that's the short <laughs> I thing. love it. Yeah. I love well, it. So I'm like, I'm like is, that, is that a good civilian way that's, to put it? Yep, that's perfect. Um, Certain qualifications so, and the Green Beret proves it. Yeah. So it's a point of pride. You know, it's a, I remember when Trent went to get his Green Beret, he was trying to find something that would prove I'm intelligent and capable, but I don't have to scream it from the rooftops. So the Green Beret was really a way for him to just be able to silently walk through post and everybody knew that that Green Beret stood for this guy deserves respect on so many levels and he's proven it over and over again. So it was a good fit for him. So the Green Beret Foundation is a nonprofit organization that supports Green Berets and their families, past, present, future, by providing programs and services for them to supplement things that the Army hasn't done or can't do, really. Or if the Army can, of course, the Army is going to cover them under TRICARE services or any command services that they can. But if there's something that the command or TRICARE can't reach, then we try to help if they're active duty. Otherwise, we can help in a lot of ways. And if I'm not saying that correctly, I'm just going to put the caveat in there that uh, the foundation can correct anything that I've just misrepresented. This this is not an official (laughs) representation. No, I love it. This is not an official representation. Your job is to help those families and especially to fill in the gaps because there are a lot of wonderful government offered programs and health insurance and different things for survivors. And there are certain things that you said, whether the military does or cannot do, it's great to see the private sector, the charitable side of America step in. So I love I love that's what you're exactly doing, right. the difference you're making. Of course, that's how I know you, again, through Krista Anderson and her, her good work with the same foundation. Let's take a quick break and then come back, and we want you to tell us all about all the resilience work you're doing, this, this Harvard and books and studies and humor in your column. <laughs> how do we take just this concept of resilience but maybe look to some concrete uh, studies and things that you can point us to that can kind of help us build up? We'll be right back.
All right, Beth. So you found Mason McDonald, whether you wanted to or not. You've ridden off into the sunset. Now the two of you are married. You've got this this beautiful blended family that I imagine has ups and downs like any other family. You're mm-hmm. working with the Green Beret Foundation as a veteran service mm-hmm. officer. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the research and the writing and the column and things that you've been involved in and how that's helping you find and develop resilience, but even more how it's helping you share the idea of resilience with others? Well, I think it's helping me share the idea because throughout my journey, I've found things that I hadn't been able to find or be exposed to in my journey as a Department of Defense employee or military family member. And and that's probably because these ideas have been progressing over time. It's not that we've been deprived of them because the military is very good about trying to educate us and keep us you know, self-reliant and resilient. That's really the goal of the family readiness group anyway. And as new ideas come in, they're introduced. So after my event and after Mason's wife died and we got closer, we were starting to realize our friends were distancing themselves for us for different reasons. And we were having this experience with grief and widowhood that we could share but also learn more from. So we started to become more educated and also try to advocate more for other people because there were so many widows and widowers, widowers on the active duty side, because Mason knew a lot of men that were becoming widowers and they were looking to him for help. And then I'd already been exposed to the widow community for quite a while and how could we help people? So I was introduced to post-traumatic growth. And so we started doing research and we started trying to educate ourselves and spread some information about that while doing more research and while getting more connected into those niches, really. Because there's 1% of the private sector and the military sector that's really geared toward post-traumatic growth and 99% is focused on the stress of the event. So we started doing a lot of research. We started getting into a lot of different corners with like the university of Syracuse and the department of state. And there's a lot of little tiny places. None of this is huge or well-known at all. And then there was one of the professors at Harvard Extension School that I was talking to about this. And then it just kind of mushroomed out into little tiny parts of it. Tuesday's Children um, is another fantastic organization that really focuses on post-traumatic growth for children and how we could learn from them for adults and mentor with other adults and go to different countries and do different things with different populations of widows and people who have been involved with gang violence or all kinds of things. It was just just this beautiful thing happening where we were able to reach so many people and help so many others on a very small scale, very grassroots. But it was, it was just this unexpected outcome of, you know, just, our circumstances. And it, it's so weird to say it's a calling, but it's just like it happened. And so we just kind of ran with it because people would come to us and ask us for help and we would just help. We couldn't, I, I can't say no if somebody asks me for help. I'm like, I'll figure out a way to do it. So we just kind of started figuring out a way to help people when they were asking for it. And it really ultimately would give people hope because the only thing they knew was the sad part of it. And this is where my story ends. And whether it be a a traumatic event, any traumatic event, or a death, and we're like, no, 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 it doesn't have to end there. Of course, there's a lot of mud to go through. But on the other side, when you get to it, there's a lot of work to do, but it's worth it. And I always think of like going into a workout. I never want to go into a workout. I'm always like, ugh, I'd rather not. But it's on the end, like even the day after, usually you feel pretty good if you don't overdo it. Because right. if you, you overdo anything, even thinking about things, 
that's too much. They start thinking you're crazy. I think the hardest part after you lose somebody is not the actual loss itself. I mean, that's hard. And yes, they're gone. But I think the hardest part is the fantasy of what your future looked like, which is just a fantasy because there's nothing set in stone right. anyway. You don't know what it would have actually been. It, well, right. But, yeah. but yeah. it's just the, and, this illusional fantasy. And, you know, I just had a short, my first boyfriend um, since my husband died and we just broke up. And it was interesting because I'm grieving again the loss of thinking about potentially a future. And it's re brought up grief. And it's like, why did, why does this have to happen? <laughs> I finally feel like I yeah. can move forward. And then it's like, oh, so that didn't work out. And now I get to revisit all of this crap again. Start like, back. I'm yeah. over it. Yeah. How dare that guy? You just, you know what? When we get off this call, you tell me who he is. <laughs> Just I will send you Beth. his address. <laughs> I love you, Beth. I I'm going to the... call him. Uh, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I love no, the it's, concept it's... of growth, post-traumatic growth. Yeah. We, don't, we don't talk about yeah. it that way. We talk about it as yeah. post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic yeah. stress disorder. We do focus on kind of the negative of what's happened rather than the celebration, which feels like the wrong word, but it might be the right word. The celebration of the fact that we've been through these traumatic things and there is a post there is a life after. There is more to come. Yeah. And it's going to be full of ups and downs. I know sometimes I'm guilty of, of getting in the mindset of the if only, you know, this fantasy uh-huh. future. Of, if only my husband were still alive, then my kids would magically obey and clean their rooms and be nice to each other. And nothing would be hard in life because we'd be living a fairy tale, or, which isn't true. Or, or even, I, I know for me, I mean, I imagine if I had kids at home, the story I would tell myself was, well, if John was here, they wouldn't be doing this right, right. now. Right, right. And I somewhat still do that with my adult children. Yeah. And I'm like, how rude of him to leave me with this. And now what am I supposed to do with it? But yeah, we don't really actually know yeah. what it would be like well, yeah. if they actually were but to here. find growth, to mm-hmm. find and growth that, rather than just so, stress. Yeah. But like the fantasy part is so true. I read this fantastic article. I, I want to say it was in the New York Times, but I love essays. And so this widow wrote... In her multiverse, she doesn't know if she and her husband would have been divorced. And she always has this, like, happy picture. She's like, but what if it weren't like that? Right. And I thought, oh, that's the truth. Because, you know, I had I had been so mad at my late husband for so many things. And, you know, who knows? Who knows where we would have ended up? You know, in my multiverse, we could have had a perfect life. We could have, you know, I don't know. I, I could be a famous singer Somewhere. I don't know. I could Dancer, like, you could have been the footloose, the footloose recreation. That could have been you for sure. That's right. I could be off somewhere with Kevin Bacon right now. <laughs> I just don't know. And you know, if I'm honest with myself, who knows? Who knows? It, Trent could have run off with somebody else. I don't know. Right. Well, right? and even so, if I mean, stayed... we just don't really know. And I know for yes. my husband and I were married 32 years, and then he got cancer. So it's like. We had been through ups and downs and we had just come through a really hard time and really recommitted in our marriage and started planning the next 30 years. And literally, we were no sooner done planning those 30 years than we were in the hospital and finding out that he had an incurable cancer. And it's like, Uh, well, that really sucks. Yeah. Like, right? He, He did not plan that well. He did not plan that well. And I... He wasn't a good planner. He just took his life a day at a just time. Take but, it and run. You know, Obviously, and actually, yeah. I I actually appreciate that because it's a trait that I've been able to now incorporate. So, but that goes to post traumatic growth problems right. here post-traumatic for me. Like growth, I would love to hear more about that because I look at me. I'm like, I'm finally taking steps to move forward, and then it doesn't work out. And then there's that sense of loss again. And it's like, is this growth or did I just slide back two steps or, you know, like, I don't even know what to do with myself now. It's like, I don't. Dance to Footloose for sure. Because Uh, Turn it up loud. Yeah. Footloose, you don't know what you're doing with Footloose. I mean, I don't know what (laughs) I'm doing with it. Feel it and go. Right. Exactly. Feel it and go. And then, you know, you're just shuffling your feet all over the place, which is much what you're doing when you're grieving. So when you're trying to question, like, am I growing or am I not? There are just some essential truths through the growth process. 
And one of them is dignity. So when you take this dignity model for growth, and it came from Harvard, and I oh I, I can't remember the name of the author of the book at the moment. It is sitting upstairs on my table. But the Harvard Dignity Model comes from this author. It's a beautiful way of acknowledging people. And, you know, and there's a lot of beautiful things that came out of, you know, giving people value, giving people dignity and things like that, and how we move toward growth from a stress perspective. And it has to, it does have a timeline. And, you know, people say we all grieve differently and grief goes on forever. But there there are certain Time right. There are there are certain things that like we're both part of uh, some widow groups, and you know, a new widow comes on, and they're like, "I can't stop crying. My husband just died two weeks ago," and we're we're all like, "What do we all do? We got all in there. Take it easy with yourself. This and is going to pass. Kind to yeah. Be kind to yourself. Yeah. Allow yourself to feel the Let tears. Let yourself feel. You're going to get through this, and next month will be a little bit easier. But that first year is yeah. hard." And then they come back and they're like, this first year was really hard. And now I'm hearing things about the second year being harder. And I don't think I can do it if it's harder. And and then we all get in there and say, it's harder, but, but, you can but do you're it. going to do it and yeah. it's going to be okay. And then you're going to start to breathe. So yeah, there are mar- markers, right? There is timelines of markers that are just That's kind right. of what they are right. for all yeah, of us to a point. Yeah. And you don't rush any of them. And at any point in your grief, you know, like at 10 years, we're at milestone markers, you know, Gwen's graduating high school, and that's a very bittersweet moment. And, you know, Mason is the father that she has more memories with, and he's such an excellent dad. And Gwen and Mason have an amazing relationship, and there's great love there. But there's still that bittersweet, Trent's not here. And so there's still struggle with that. And then there are still tears. And people will be like, but it's been 10 years. <laughs> still going to cry at our wedding. Right. And so is Mason. You know? right. And yeah. when Eli gets married, if Eli ever gets married, when Eli graduated college, I remembered what a milestone that was for Bobby. And I remember she was so looking forward to him going to college and graduating. And when he did, I was a mess because I remember how much my friend loved her son. And I want to love him as much as she did and protect him as much as she did. We've got a lot going on in this family with our kids. Yeah. So when we hit milestones, our kids are like, you know, that's a big thing. And there's tears all around. So, well, and I'll tell you. I love that. Um, you know, I remember early on in my grief, like within the first month or two, I remember meeting a widow who was about a decade out and I was grateful that she still had tears. I was grateful to know that a decade from now it would still hurt. Maybe I'd be a little stronger. Maybe I'd have a little more of my wits about me, you know, maybe not be as dark and, and lost as that first year, but the last thing I want, everyone says time heals all wounds. Like in time, I'm just going to forget this beautiful part of my life ever existed. I hated that thought. I love the idea that you can still feel and move forward. You can have a beautiful life, bittersweet. You can be excited about this relationship your daughter has with this new father figure and this wonderful man in your life. And you can still miss the fact that Trent's not here. Like it's not or. And I think that's what's so important and what you've helped us learn today and last week, these wonderful conversations about resilience. You've taught me so much I'm really going to go home and think about that post-traumatic growth. I'm going to write that on a little sticky note yeah. and put it by my bed. Because the stress, I feel the stress. I'll tell you, I'm on year, what, three and a half? I think it's way harder than year one and two. In fact, I have some yeah. friends who just barely had a horrible tragedy happen in their lives, and they, they buried a young daughter. And I went to the funeral, mm. and it was beautiful, and it was uplifting, and it was full of tears and laughter and love. And I almost missed the bubble that they're in. You know that bubble when you're so new and everything's so foggy mm-hmm. and you just can't wait to get out of the bu- fog because you know you're in the fog? Now some yeah. days I wish I were back in the fog yeah. because the fog is a yeah, protective Yeah, you don't know what's coat. going on. I, I'd yeah, love now to be I'm, that oblivious. Now it's I'm hyper like... aware of the stress, but I need to turn it into growth. So thank you. <laughs> Post-traumatic, yeah. I got all the stress. Can there possibly be some growth? Because, man, I'll tell you, these lately I felt like I'm slipping I want to share this really time. quick. I, I saw it today in a widow's group. 
And I hate it, but I also love it. (laughs) It's both. When I come to the end of the road and the sun has set for me, I want no rights in a gloom-filled room. Why cry for a soul set free? Miss me a little, but not too long, and not with your head bowed low. Remember the love that we once shared. Miss me, but let me go. Hmm. For this is a journey that we all must take, and each must go alone. It's all part of the Master's plan, a step in the road to home. When you are lonely and sick of heart, go to the friends we know and bury your sorrows in doing good, in doing good deeds. Miss me, but let me go. Yeah, that's hard. That's beautiful. And I see where you say you hate that. And yet there's there's serious truth in the fact that we can miss those that we've loved and we can let them go in a way that we still move forward with the memories and the love. I don't know that we ever let the love go. I'm certainly never letting Brent go, but there is certainly that sense that you have to let go of the the weight of it and take forward the, the lessons, the beauty, the growth, and keep giving yeah. and keep serving. I don't know that, yeah, I don't know that we ever do let them go, you know? Cause yeah, we've got, I don't think we actually like, do, but at the same time, I feel like there's some truth in that because I know my husband wanted me to move forward yeah and i feel like we can move forward with them and have that balance yeah and you know having having somebody understand like it's not you or him and it mason always mason did this weird thing when we got together like you know trent is ever present because it's a military death and everybody's mentioning him and not everybody was mentioning bobby and it was like there's no difference here. We both have a dead spouse and we both have children with a dead parent that we have to honor yeah. and yep. and tell stories about. And I wasn't getting the connection. I guess it's a man thing. But Mason needed a little bit more uh, leverage on the guy side, I guess. And I think a lot of widows have or have had boyfriends that may relate to that because they're competing with a dead guy Mm -hmm. and there's no competition there, but there is some, some coexisting. Right. And coexisting in our house. Yeah. And there's, there's coexisting in our house because I feel like Bobby and Trent are very much a part of our lives because we, we remind the kids what their parents were like and we've got, they're legacy items for the kids. So when the kids, Eli has his own household, but it's not big enough for him to keep some of the furniture from Bobby and Mason or some of all the artwork. And, you know, when Gwen moves out and has her house, we've got some things from me and Trent's household that she may want. But, you know, we keep those things alive for them so they can cherish their memories going forward. And if they don't want them, they don't have to have them, but we just keep them as an option. And I think that's an essential part of anybody going forward and considering other relationships. If that's something that they want to do and get into another relationship and love again, then it's perfectly okay to still love your late spouse and acknowledge that that relationship was a huge part of your history and Here's another person to love. If you're blessed to love that much, by all means, do that. Absolutely. And if, and you know, the great thing is like, for instance, in in this relationship, I just ended, um, I, I really love this man, still love him. It's just not going to work. And so at some point you have to call it, you know? And, um, the good news is, is that I learned that I can love. And so there is that, but yeah, th- this whole process on growth and moving forward, man, it's it's a journey, and we Beth, could probably is, spend yeah. we could keep two going. more hours on this. But we've this got to wrap has up. been we've amazing. Got our next yeah. guest on the next line, so um, we're we're so grateful that you could join us these two times in a row and just tell us a little about your journey, post traumatic growth, how we move forward. It, it's not just that they're a part of um, your past; the, these people we've lost are a part of who we are today. Mm-hmm. 
I think you've mm-hmm. given us a lot to think about. Thank you for joining us and sharing so much of your time, helping us understand how to be relentless in our resilience and how to laugh at ridiculous and be ridiculous along the way. Absolutely. Thank you, Beth, so much. If you like Thank what you. you've heard, you can subscribe to our podcast and give us a rating and a review. If you know someone who has a story that they'd like to share on our show, something that they've endured, maybe it's you, reach out to us. Send us an email at rrpodcast at ksl.com. You can also find us on Facebook at Relentlessly Resilient and Relentlessly Resilient Podcast on Instagram. You can DM us. Uh, We will reach out to you and we'll figure out when we can get you on our show. Thank you so much. And remember, whatever you do today, remember to be kind. You have no idea the struggles other people are dealing with in their lives. Take care, everybody.